Gary Lineker and match of the day. For those of you not from Britain, we have this thing called the BBC. No, not that one. It's British Broadcasting Corporation. And the British Broadcasting Corporation has a thing called a TV license. You have to have a, got a license for that. It's one of the reasons why we have that meme about Britain, because everything's so fucking regulated. You have to have a license for everything. We're not a very permissible society. But the BBC was founded on some principles, you see. It was founded on the principle of independence, independent journalism, independent broadcasting. And so as a result of that, it's a misconception. They are not directly charging you for their services. They were granted a special exemption by the British government, who at the time recognised the importance of independent broadcasting and having a sort of fourth estate to hold politicians accountable and speak truth to power that was truly owned by the people. So the government agreed to forego an already existing tax, it was a tax for the possession of broadcasting materials, i.e. TV and aerial, you know, and as technology leveled up, all of the rest of it, uh, even an internet connection now. The tax that you pay to have those things in your house doesn't go to the government, it goes to the BBC. And the BBC has been a terrible business model especially in a digital age and they've rightly come under criticism for enforcement of procuring these license fees they have special powers because it is effectively a tax and so they have dickheads who come to your door if you don't pay a license fee and they're like third party bailiffs and bailiffs are the scum of the earth and so what they do is they try and use jedi mind tricks to make you think they've got court ordered authority when they don't they fucking snoop around your house looking through your windows and curtains to see if you do have a television obviously the only appropriate response when they come knocking on your door is fuck off you've got no legal right to come into my fucking house uh, also they use the, these vans that supposedly have really refined radar technology which i always thought was a fucking meme they run commercials you know on the bbc itself you're not gonna license we'll lock you up the bottom line is in this day and age with the digital landscape being the way it is and so it's easier than ever to just simply deny me the right to see your programming and also we've had 10 years of tory fucking austerity measures more than 10 years at this point we're in a recession and you're charging little old ladies to have a fucking tv in their house when it might be the only thing they have that's even akin to company and then you take them to court if they don't pay it it's unconscionable it's nonsense it's an archaic business model and the point i also want to make is multiple sequential governments including labor and conservative governments have all threatened to take away the special exemption for the bbc if they feel they are getting harsh or biased coverage against their bullshit the tories love this boris johnson did it we're on collision course again for it under rishi sunak it's gonna happen but it certainly happened back in the blair days as well and so the bbc pauses as being an impartial and not government controlled entity but are they really because the government can take away their business model tomorrow with the fucking swish of a pen so obviously they have to sort of tore a line to a certain degree and this has been at a number of sort of media scandals where journalists have been fired part of the agreement of being a BBC employee, which is a very lucrative position to have within society. Part of the agreement you make is you have to be impartial because that is at the core of the BBC's business model. And so you're not supposed to tweet, fuck the Tories, even though fuck the Tories, right? You're not supposed to do that. If I worked for the BBC, I couldn't say fuck the Tories. It's actually baked in. It would be in my contract. I have to be impartial. The difficulty starts getting into that makes sense for journalism, that makes sense for news, but as BBC has expanded into other areas of programming, does it make sense for an actor? Does it make sense for David Jason on Only Fools and Horses that they show on fucking endless reruns? Does it make sense that David Jason can't say fuck the Tories? By the way, you will quickly learn that this entire spiel is just an excuse to say fuck the Tories a lot. But anyway, it's like predictive programming, I'm priming the pump. Anyway, you know, does it make sense for somebody in their theatre and arts division to sort of, you know, not be allowed to say, fuck the Tories? And ultimately, when we get down to it, does it make sense that Gary fucking Lineker, who hosts Match of the Day, a show about football, 
doesn't get to say fuck the Tories. And the problem you've got is, yeah, he's a figurehead. Yeah, he speaks for the BBC. Yeah, he's agreed to this measure multiple times and violated it multiple times and been warned about it multiple times. But the issue is, should the journalistic professional standard and agreement that you have in the realm of politics bleed out into the realm of entertainment? And that is the fundal philosoph fundamental philosophical debate at where we're at now. So understanding all of that background, hopefully you can see that actually this is a more complicated issue than just saying fuck the Tories. Because I hate to break it to you, Labour would be pulling the same shit if somebody criticised uh, Labour, like they did in the Blair years and the Gordon Brown years, and they would absolutely, and the BBC would also have to tell somebody if you went, "I love Labour," they would have to pull you up on the same thing. So keep all that in mind. But let's just see what are these mad, insane, controversial comments that iconoclast Gary Lineker uh, has made. And look, I'll just also start by saying here's some general thoughts about gary lineker that i have now italia 90 is the best world cup of all time i know people are trying to say this qatari one is not for me um but italia 90 is the greatest world cup of all time it was you know the first world cup i could truly enjoy as a child but it's not just nostalgia gary lineker was a very good player uh, for england one of their legendary goal scorers gary lineker is a beloved figure he is a beloved figure i mean he went his entire career without even getting a yellow card the only like professional footballer i believe to do it although there might be some ones that you haven't heard of since but gary lineker was generally regarded as a nice guy and he was a loyal guy when he played his football and he had to retire a little bit injury due to a toe injury which he couldn't get fixed he ended his career playing in japan he was a, a legend for doing that you know and they all loved him out there he put a spotlight on japanese football and helped the game evolve he's just a nice dude in general and obviously, because he's from Leicester and he started his career at Leicester, he also was an ambassador for Leicester, including, you know, like Walker's Crisps and that sponsorship deal. And so he gave back to his community because he's a nice guy. But I will add, Twitter will fucking fuck you up. Twitter, you can be the nicest dude in the world, and I can speak to experience on this, and an errant tweet can make you look like the biggest cunt and i have to say gary's 62 now and he tweets things that i just think are a little bit insufferable sometimes even if i agree with the sentiment there is a sanctimoniousness to the things he says and remember he's an unbelievably privileged person because of the way the bbc is funded we know how much he's paid he gets 1.35 million pounds a year to present match of the day he lives in one of the most affluent areas in london and also, coincidentally, because we're about to talk about immigration briefly, one of the least diverse. It's 97% white people, 97% British born. It's ridiculous. And he speaks out on issues that I believe are well out of his wheelhouse, because I don't know the last time he's been, you know, to working class communities and stuff like that. And I wish he'd stay out of it, because I love Gary Lineker. I think he's a great guy. I think his heart is in the right place. I think he's a humanitarian. I think he's a credit to the sport. I think he's a fantastic host. I think I think filling the void on Match of the Day was a tough job, and he's made the role his own. And I stand in solidarity with him, because I'm principally anti-censorship. But equally, you're taking that money equally with that money comes an agreement you're not going to say these things equally you have agreed that you won't say these things again in past instances when you've had warnings and slaps on the wrist when a less popular person would have just been fired by the bbc an entry-level journalist would have been fired by the bbc so it's tough i'll also add as well there's hypocrisy at play because the the comments i'm about to show you are are correct i i agree with his commentary but he's speaking about the rights of people being oppressed by governments but he did qatar he didn't show solidarity with all the indentured servants that built those stadiums he didn't show solidarity with the lgbtq community he didn't show solidarity for women's rights he took the money 
and then did a pithy 30 minute monologue at the start of the show saying yes it's complicated Qatar it's not complicated you could have not took the money you're an abundantly wealthy and privileged man you could have took a stand much like you're taking a stand here so you have to add that in there there is a little bit of the old you know rules for thee thing going on but let's let's just look at what these unbelievably contentious comments uh, uh, were. Suella Braverman has said... Right. Over 45,000 people made the unsafe, unnecessary and illegal journey across the channel. Our asylum system has been overwhelmed. We're now spending almost £7 million a day on hotels. Stopping the boats is one of the five promises the Prime Minister has made to the British people, and it's my top priority. That's why today I'm announcing a new illegal migration bill to do exactly that. The Prime Minister the and I have help. been working flat out for months to bring this legislation to Parliament. This bill will mean that if you come here illegally, you will not be able to stay. You will be detained and removed to your home country if safe, or a safe third country like Rwanda. We are committed to helping those in need, like the hundreds of thousands of people we have supported from Ukraine, Afghanistan and Hong Kong in recent years. But it's not fair that people who travel through a string of safe countries and then come to the UK illegally can jump the queue and game our system. This bill will bring an end to that. Enough is enough. We must stop the boats. So, listen, while I don't disagree that, yes, we do need to overhaul our immigration system uh, to some degree, can I just add that isn't it amazing that after all these years, oh, well over a decade, of Tory austerity measures, austerity measures where they came up with incredible schemes like let's attack the disabled by taking away people's disability benefits, let's slash the NHS to the bone, but certainly keep hospital administrators in their cushy roles. Let's not negotiate with the nurses for basic pay rises at a time of incredible inflation. Let's not negotiate with the train drivers who are taking strike action when they essentially make the country work. Let's reduce school lunches and take away free food for starving, impoverished kids. And by the way, more and more and more austerity measures, too many to list, and then they went into their rooms cloaked in darkness <laughs> like, and, and they said, look, Satan, we need the office for five minutes. They all got round a table and they said, you know what? The British people are hurting again. Who the fuck should we blame? And they came up with the novel idea, the bloody immigrants. Of course, a Tory fucking classic, a Tory classic. Well, at colour me surprised. Well done. Now, the system is broken but do you want to know what else is broken our system of governance in britain you want to know what else is utterly broken the way you treat the working class in britain that they can't get pay rises for essential jobs just two years after a pandemic where they were heralded as heroes the nurses have to bow and beg and scrape for a few uh, more pennies from the tory coffers meanwhile during that same pandemic you self-enriched with crony capitalism and dodgy deals for your friends you tip them off about ways to oh you want to make testing kits and all that now that's the new final frontier this is all public knowledge by the way in a cap it off while you were doing that while we were locked up while you enforced with police action people not even being able to bury their families as they died in droves you partied and drank wine and then tried to cover it up implying the investigation was biased as that is more broken than our fucking immigration system. And I'm not saying Labour are going to fix it, but it's going to be all too sweet to see the Tories out of power. Now, over on the flip side of the coin, our asylum system doesn't need changing. It's very simple. The way it works currently is no matter how you get to the country, if you have a valid asylum claim, you will be processed and granted asylum and essentially rehoused. Now, we've often internationally been considered a bit of a soft touch. And also, you know, if you can make it to France, if you're fleeing a war-torn country, or even if you're an economic migrant looking for a better life, which by the way, I don't know why the term economic migrant 
migrant is sort of tarnished and stained in such a way, wouldn't you move around the country looking for a better lot? Don't we do that just in our own very, you know, kind of like hoity-toity way? Well, I have a British passport, so I get to work anywhere, I suppose. Well, Brexit fucked that up, didn't it? But anyway, forget all of that. The bottom line is that's always been the way it's worked. And people, yes, certainly some people have gamed the system. But I'll also add one of the biggest countries that people are coming from is Afghanistan. And I can't help but notice what we did there. One of the other biggest countries is Syria. And I can't help but notice what we did there. I live in Birmingham, where we have a huge amount of Iraqis that have come over here. And I can't help but notice what we did there. So also, maybe if we fixed our foreign fucking policy... Maybe if we stopped getting into bed with imperialist America, maybe there wouldn't be this diaspora of refugees looking for asylum and economic opportunities because our rapacious attitude has destroyed their countries and made them unlivable. So, it is a complex issue. It is. It's not ideal that we put these people in hotels. It's not ideal that, you know, predatory news outlets like the Daily Mail gets to, you know, uh, interview someone who's gone through the asylum process and they say oh and i got a free phone and i'm in this four-star hotel and that's in, in all of this and then working class people who are on their knees because of the fucking tories they say look they've got more than me i can't afford a mobile phone it's basically classic divide and conquer politics because you should be angry at the politicians and so what do they do they're now looking to limit asylum claims essentially and here's the point asylum is just a fundamental human right that any country should offer asylum is just like if i am in a situation where it's too dangerous for me to remain in my own country a country that isn't as dangerous should offer citizens of the world that right to go there and be free and live in dignity without fear of being killed because of who they are or you know what tribe they belong to if it's an african civil war or you know whatever it is and so it's fascinating to me to see this type of language about stop the boats, stop the boats, stop the boats. It's like, listen, better question. Why are motherfuckers getting on boats to come here in the first place? And we've got to hold up our hands and hold ourselves culpable. And I've always been a believer in this. While I do feel, yes, the work, you have to acknowledge this, the working class are disproportionately affected by mass migration. There is no doubt about that. The numbers don't lie. It's not racist or weird to say that. But also, the reason people are coming here in the first place is because we are destroying their countries. And so I believe the countries, the imperialist countries that destroy other countries, have a moral responsibility to at least get you on the downside. Yeah, we bombed the shit out of your country for oil. Our bad. Here's a four-star hotel in a country where you don't speak the language very well. And P.S. There's a bunch of gammons outside waiting to kick your head in because they're racist arseholes. You know, it's not like a particularly great fucking deal when you wait up. Well, I would have just liked my house with a little bit of land. But you blew that the fuck up with a Predator drone because uh, you thought I was harboring terrorists, and this is just collateral damage. So, look, there's lots going on. There's lots going on. There are economic migrants, right? Absolutely. There are people with legitimate asylum claims and illegitimate asylum claims. But we absolutely have to say our foreign policy is ultimately at the root cause of this. Now, I'm more eloquent than Gary Lineker, evidently, because he went, good heavens, this is beyond awful, Right? And, oh, and I, I do agree, uh, by the way. Then he said there is no huge influx, uh, which I don't... Obviously, this isn't the important part of what he says, but actually, when you look at the numbers, uh, it, it's definitely gone up. I mean, gone up significantly. I think there was like a, a, a million... Uh, it's a million people by attempted boat crossings last year. Now, just on the me just on the methodology, boat crossings are so unbelievably dangerous. Even if you're just crossing the English Channel, you know, it, it really speaks to desperation. And where I kind of like lost a lot of people, like I remember when. Um, I got kind of cast out a little bit by the rightoids because uh, when Lauren when Lauren Southern, who I know 
sort of keeps in Destiny's orbit and, and all of this stuff. Uh, when she got on a boat and was essentially trying to capsize another boat, it appeared, based on the videos, you know, out in, I think it was off the coast of Italy. Why would you do that? Why would you do that to another human being? I don't want these people to die. I don't want them to drown. You shouldn't either. By the way, when they come over, if they, if they get here, they're sort of living illegally. <laughs> with with no like way to get credit no way to get a bank account no you know they get stopped by police they don't have any identification it's like it's fucking you know it's not a good life guys like it's crazy to me that people would be like stop the boats in fact i can't remember which one of the awful female gammons it was but um one of them uh one of the ones i think it was katie hopkins wrote a column in the sun where fucking else or it might have been news of the world she basically one of the one of those basically said shoot the boats out of the water blow them out of the water this was complained about uh to the press standard press standards agency that said while the language constituted a hate crime they wouldn't take any actions against her i mean appalling like you know so no don't shoot the boats <laughs> like not everyone gets to stay obviously i mean but for fuck's sake like just a bit of humanity would be nice but yeah the numbers have certainly gone up and these are dangerous for the people attempting them we should be looking to dissuade people getting on the boats in the first place it's got ties to human trafficking it's a, it's like it, it, it's a nightmare world these people are in in a lot of cases anyway he said there is no huge influx we take far fewer refugees than other major european countries this is just an immeasure an uh, immeasurably cruel policy to directed at the most vulnerable people in language that is not dissimilar to that used by Germany in the 30s. And I'm out of order. And the reason he says, you know, am I out of order uh, is because uh, obviously Suella Braverman went on Good Morning Britain, which is basically like, you know, the closest thing we've got to the view. It's just, again, it's gammon central. Uh, and she said she was very disappointed in Gary Lineker uh, because he called them an immeasurably cruel policy and, said, uh, and, and then basically compared them to the nazis now he didn't use the word nazi we all know what he means and this is where it gets into that murky territory um and she then also showed that she was putting political pressure on the bbc uh, equating our measure which are lawful necessary and fundamentally compassionate to 1930 the idea of a compassionate tory always makes me laugh to 1930s germany is irresponsible and i disagree with that characterization and asked if the match of the day presenter should resign or be sacked she said that's a matter for the bbc and they will resolve that and so once again all the things i've set it up for at the start of this talk they come into play the bbc's existence essentially is on the line here uh, because that the, you can imagine they're going to be petty they're going to be vindictive they're going to back channel and say to bbc executives by the way bbc executives tory executives uh, sorry tory politicians labor politicians they all went to the same schools they all went to cambridge and oxford they all know the secret handshakes they're all the same people they're all establishment you think they don't have each other on fucking speed dial you're mad so it's all one thing and by the way gary lineker is in that but we ended up with this bizarre sort of death by a thousand cuts because it just so happened it was it was before a uh, match of the day and the press went out and sort of hounded gary lineker and said do you retract uh your statements do you stand by what you said and he went, of course I do, because I said it, and it's public, and I'm not deleting the tweets, and I'm not walking it back. And it's not the first time he's said this. I mean, a lot of pro-Brexit people characterise Gary Lineker as a Ramona. He's whined about Brexit a bunch of times. Now, you know, I'm not pro-Brexit. Uh, if I wasn't in the States at the times, I would have voted Remain. Turns out maybe my vote might have actually mattered <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. Such a close vote it was. But it was only a referendum. We never had to do it anyway. And a 2%, it was within the error. It was in the margin of error. We could have, we could have had that vote on an entirely different day and got a completely di got a different outcome the other way. So I don't know why David Cameron said we had to do it. It's been a fucking disaster pretty much. I mean, like everyone agrees with it at this point. So anyway, the stories start breaking in sort of sequence the bbc have spoken to gary lineker they've sort of asked him to apologize gary lineker won't apologize and gary lineker says the idea i should have to is unconscionable and i can't believe you're enforcing it and so stick match of the day up your ass i'm not doing it right so you got this and it was hilarious it was like dominoes it was it was so crazy i'll just 
play a goal. Let's get this. Significant developments on the Gary Lineker story. Now, we at Sky understand that the BBC statement on Lineker is incorrect in stating that he's agreed to step back from presenting. <laughs> now, we're hearing that is not the case. He has instead been taken off air because he is unwilling to apologise for the comments he made this week on social media about media. government <laughs> policy. <laughs> now, we've approached the BBC <laughs> for comment Very and we await tweet. their response. As this story continues to evolve, you'll hear all the developments first here on Sky Sports News, so stay tuned. All right, well, it's Gary Lineker, so they're going to get somebody else to host, right? That's all you do, you just replace the host. There's loads of people who would love an opportunity to host a match of the day. It's the premier sports programme in British culture, of course they will. But the problem is, Ian Wright, one of the analysts on the show, jumped straight in and said, nah, I'm not appearing neither, I'm, I'm with Gary actually. Out of pace. Ian Wright has tweeted to say he will not appear on Match of the Day tomorrow night in solidarity with Gary Lineker. He's told people everyone knows what Match of the Day means to him, but in support of Lineker, he will not be on the show. Now, remember, a BBC statement earlier said the presenter had agreed to stance, to step back, was the, the phrase they used, from his role after tweets about the government immigration policy. We understand that is not the case. Lineker has been taken off air because he refuses to apologise. This... So, all right, well, OK, right, right, listen. There's still people... Danny Murphy and the boys, you know, we'll, 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 we've still got... Alan Shearer. At least Alan Shearer's going to be on. Yet more breaking news coming out of the Gary Lineker story. Um, Ian Wright, we know, is not going to appear on Match of the Day because Gary Lineker has been stood down by the BBC. Alan Shearer is not going to be there either. He has said this. I've informed the BBC I won't be appearing on Match of the Day tomorrow night. So they are standing in support of the presenter, Gary Lineker. No Ian Wright, no Alan Shearer. Will there be more? That's the entire starting line of a match of the day out. Well, all right, then fuck it. What have we got? Who else is out there? It is really, it's really hard. But you know what? Maybe this is actually the time that we can bring through some of the people that do like match of the day to and only make part-time appearances. There are some like really popular footballers out there that have bright broadcasting futures ahead of them. have really grown on me personally down the years. I mean, what you do is, right, you go out and you get Micah Richards, don't you? It makes sense. He's the natural man to carry the show. An update on the situation regarding the BBC's decision uh, to uh, for Gary Lineker not to be presenting tomorrow night's match of the day. Since that decision was made, we've seen some of the regular pundits, such as Ian Wright and Alan Shearer, say that uh, in solidarity with Lineker, they will not be on tomorrow's programme either. Well, Michael Richards has just tweeted now as well, and he said this, I was not due to be working on match of the day tomorrow, but if I was, I would find myself taking the same decision that Ian Wright and Alan Shearer have. So Richards are confirming then that uh, he wouldn't appear on it tomorrow uh, and he won't be if he was to uh, get called up for it. We've also seen a little bit more of a cryptic tweet from Alex Scott, a regular on the programme and uh, of course uh, a presenter on Football Focus as well who's said, nah, not me. So you would... Uh, in, uh, imp nah, nah, that's not me. Host match of the day, that's not me. So, all right then, fuck it, right? What we'll do is... <laughs> fuck it then <laughs> fuck it we'll just run the show with no one no analysis <laughs> no hosting we'll just give them the football with the commentary this is what they decided to do you can see it here this is in the guardian match of the day to air without presenters or pundits after gary lineker's suspension and what they planned to do was they were like okay well we'll fucking just have it with football and commentary but then the commentators started saying we're not even going to commentate the fucking games and you better not use any of our commentary that we've done we don't want to be associated with you we don't want to be a scab we don't want to be a scab for gary lineker 
So, <laughs> right. So here you go. Faced with an effective strike by its on-screen staff and unable to find willing replacements, the BBC took the unprecedented decision to announce the Premier League highlights program will go ahead without any host or studio presentation. It will feature only match footage. A BBC spokesperson said, some of our pundits have said that they don't wish to appear on the program while we seek to resolve the situation with Gary. We understand their position. We have decided that the program will focus on match action without studio, and present studio presentation and punditry but then late on friday the commentator steve wilson tweeted that he's decided to pull out of the program as commentators on match of the day we've decided to step down from tomorrow night's broadcast we are comforted that football fans who want to watch their teams should still be able to do so as management can use world feed commentary if they wish now Here's the thing, the BBC has the option to use this thing called World Feed, right? The World Feed means you can pull other people's commentary. It's like basically people commentate on the games and it's just up for general usage over the people you would specifically employ to do uh, the games. And so anyway, it's all right then. They don't, I don't even need your commentary. Fuck you, commentators. Go stand in solidarity with big ears. Yeah, we're the BBC. We get shit done around these parts. We don't care. But here's the problem. They can't use the World Feed commentary. They're not signed up to it. So they can't have it. And so in the end, as reported here on the prestigious Wales Online, they had to cut the show to 20 minutes because they couldn't get commentary for the fucking games. Now... <laughs> all the while that this is going on, by the way, Gary Lineker is watching Leicester play laughing his tits off because what the BBC have done is put themselves in a proverbial rock in a hard place. Gary Lineker, beloved personality, slightly insufferable, but definitely on the right side of this one. And, uh, you know, that's the rock. The hard place, of course, is the government threatening to take your license away. So the BBC went and they sort of had a chit chat about it all. But, you know, at the end of the day, they're, they're now thinking and strategizing what they do next, right? And certainly, you know, maybe things will calm down. Maybe things will calm down eventually. Maybe we can work this out. I mean, you know, think about it. What would be the worst thing that could realistically happen? It would probably be if they were given loads and loads and loads of pressure by another political party in Britain. That would really make things bad. You know, obviously, you know, they're going to get it off the Tories, but certainly... You know, as long as Labour doesn't kick up a stink, everything's going to be all right. We've got some more reaction to the breaking news this evening that the BBC have taken Gary Lineker off air because he's refused to apologise for tweeting about government policy. Now, a Labour Party source has called the BBC's decision to remove Gary Lineker as cowardly. The source has said this. The BBC's cowardly decision to take Gary Lineker off air is an assault on free speech in the face of political pressure. Tory politicians lobbying to get people sacked for disagreeing with government policies should be laughed at, not pandered to. The BBC should rethink their decision. We have contacted the government for a response and also, of course, we are waiting to hear back from the BBC. As All right, then. This shit's fucking spot. This is an international incident now. It's certainly, it, it, it's all over the fucking place. What are we going to do? So the BBC went, racked their brains. Right, we're going to have to fucking eat crow on this one. It's going to be rough. Kia Starmer, you know, again, part of the establishment. He wasted no time in turning the screw. Here it is, funnily enough, reported on the BBC website. They got the it BBC badly The BBC is not acting impartially. By caving in. By the way, in case you're wondering what that stuff on the sign is there, because you're like, wait, has Zinch got a new champion in fucking Warhammer? <laughs> no, that's Welsh. Uh, but anyway. To Tory MPs who are complaining about Gary Lineker. They've got this one badly wrong, and now they're very, very exposed, as is the government, because at the heart of this is the government's failure on the asylum system. And rather than take responsibility for the mess they've made, the government is casting around to blame anybody else. Gary Lineker, the BBC, civil servants, the blob. What they should be doing is standing up, accepting they've broken the asylum system and tell us in, telling us what they're going to do to actually fix it, not whinging on. Imagine how bad you have to fuck up with just political policy and handling a row where you make Keir Starmer not look like a skinwalker. Incredible shit, right? 
So it's bad. So BBC, they came out and they offered an apology of sorts because Match of the Day is an institution. People sit down and watch Match of the Day's families. You let your kids stay up late. It's on the weekend. It's the football. Everybody of my generation, you grew up with Match of the Day. You know the theme tune instinctively. So they offered, like I say, initially something of a mea culpa. Again, we'll go to The Guardian. BBC apologises for the disarray to the sports coverage due to Gary Lineker's walkout. And they said, uh, the BBC has apologised for the changes to this weekend's sporting schedule and said it is working hard to resolve the situation and hopes to do so soon. The broadcaster's radio and TV timetables have been left in disarray as a series of presenters pulled out of shows after Gary Lineker was told to step back from hosting Match of the Day in a row over impartiality. A spokesperson said the BBC will only be able to bring limited sport programming this weekend and our schedules will be updated to reflect that. We are sorry for these changes, which we recognise will be disappointing for BBC sports fans. We are working hard to resolve the situation and hope to do so soon so how are you going to resolve it well this is the problem you see it, you've got a lot of fucking things to think about the independent sort of for a change summed it up quite succinctly because if gary lineker if they sort of back down and apologize well look bbc fears it cannot sack lineker or force him to follow social media rules and you can see uh, the bbc fears it cannot sack sack the host of match of the day or force him to allow social media rules on a brit uh, on impartiality because of ambiguities in his contract the independent understands the corporation should be forced to pay a million or could be forced to pay millions if they wanted to oust lineker and would probably lose any legal claim brought by the match of the day presenter senior figures believe lineker who was forced off air after complaining about the government's silence policy uh, and comparing it to language used in the 1930s germany is understood to be on a two-year contract negotiated before current director general tim davy was appointed mr davy has repeatedly emphasized the importance of the bbc's impartiality and let a crackdown on bbc stars making political comments on social media but lineker's contract was already in place and has not been updated handing an important advantage to the presenter as the dispute intensifies and so just to get all those ads off the screen he doesn't even have and this is the thing that's been misreported he doesn't even have the contractual obligation for the impartiality in the first place and yes if you're wondering about tim davy he's a donator to the conservative party as far as i remember obviously now the bbc director general and a guy who says oh maybe the bbc does take it a bit too hard on tories so anyway the bbc have shit the bed as much as you can shit a bed. The bed is full of shit. There is more shit than bed in this instance. And they are absolutely going to have to back down. And Gary Lineker fucking knows it. Because of course, there's absolutely nothing uh, they can do. I'll also just add a few other little bits and pieces to the story. Also worth noting that the Managers Association in the Premier League said a number of their members would not be providing post-match interviews as per the agreement with Match of the Day in the Football Association. They didn't want their faces on the sort of pro-censorship Tory hour version of Match of the Day. So credit to those guys. It's a little bit more of a noble cause, isn't it, when Sir Alex Ferguson did it in a tantrum because he'd been exposed doing dodgy shit relating to his son and agent fees anyway then also just to make the whole thing fucking more surreal right watch how much of the day happened on the air it's mental it, it's like it's like a black mirror episode they did oh, they didn't One, even play the thing we were able to show our normal match of the day including commentary tonight but here now is the best action from today's premier league matches didn't even do this when the bloody queen died that's how bad it is they just don't want to be they don't even want the theme tune associated with it uh now i'll add some people did come up with some pretty fucking novel ways of getting around it you know how like in esports people always say how do i become a caster and you say well you watch a demo and you commentate over it and you record it and then you upload it somewhere and see if people like it and try and work off the feedback. People were using the lack of sports commentary to try their own commentary and see if they could maybe step up to the plate. Here's one uh, example I saw on uh, Twitter. Oh, the Tories. 
Fuck the Tories. Fuck the Tories. Fuck the Tories. Oh, fuck the Tories. 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 You get the message. So, it wasn't all bad then, in that sense. Just because the world is awful as well, I'll have to do this to you. I apologize wholeheartedly for making you aware of the existence of this, but it is a necessary uh, part of, uh, of the story. The Gammon Hub itself, GB News, they decided they were going to step up to the plate and offer an alternative to match of the day. So if you're a gammon and you like sports, you can go and watch GB News. They themselves were really showing that we weren't missing anything without Gary Lineker. We're making TV and radio history tonight. Welcome to the alternative match of the day. The BBC have gone on strike, so we're delivering, uh, delivering an hour of football action, great punditry and no virtue signalling in sight. Uh, now, Patrick, uh, two big games uh, to get through in this part. Uh, mm. We've got uh, Leeds, Brighton. But first, what happened at Leicester today? Yes, well, uh, it does appear now that this thing is working. No, it's not. Good stuff. OK, well, I will tell you. Leicester versus <laughs> Patrick, Chelsea. I mean, it was paid? absolutely fantastic. Yes, it's back. Have so, Chelsea run 3-1. All right, one, all right. Well, so it's bad news for Gary Lineker. Apparently, Gary Lineker... Look behind you. A, a beloved fox, a beloved fox. He was in the stands. I don't believe there was massive clamour to have his name chanted or a banner or a flag. Anyway, of course, he is indeed a rabid lefty. Well, it's the first time they've done it. Rough start. It surely would have got better over time. We'll just give you another another clip here uh, from this fine, fine broadcast and landmark moment in British sports broadcasting history. Uh, an emotional affection for Leeds, because when I grew up, no. they were a massive team. Uh, no, I am a Manchester United fan, so I would quite happily see Leeds go down. So, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. uh, Leeds should have probably lost Brighton. I've never been to, although I imagine that Gary Lineker would quite like Brighton because it's uh, full of rainbow flags and woke people. Uh, I think that's a fair point. Uh, the uh, tofu eating woke uh, Look, uh, lots more games to get through. Patrick. Well, then. So, uh, yeah, that was your awful alternative that you could watch. Uh, I don't know who would watch that besides uh, Nigel Farage. Uh, but yes, uh, that, that was a thing that actually happened. Now, of course, with that being the alternative, you can argue Gary Lineker was never in a stronger position to renegotiate and come back to the table. The BBC had no contractual basis to demand he apologise. We've established that. It was also just censorious in the first place to demand that he apologise. We also understand that, ultimately... Should you be demanding impartiality in all areas of your broadcast? They couldn't have predicted how popular Gary Lineker was going to be or that everyone would walk out in solidarity, including football managers in the games themselves. So the BBC rightfully have decided, having lost every single battle on every single front in absolute rank incompetence across the board, well, they've come back to the bargaining table, of course. And you can see here what they say. Good news! <laughs> The talks are moving in the right direction. I bet they are. I bet they absolutely are. Talks between the BBC and Gary Lineker are set to be moving in the right direction after a second day of scheduled uh, scheduling disruption. BBC News understands that there are hopes of a resolution soon, but not all issues are fully resolved at this stage. Weekend football coverage has been disrupted by walkouts triggered by the Match of the Day host suspension. Director General Tim Davey has apologised to licence fee payers for the changes. Presenters, pundits and commentators pulled out of BBC's football coverage in support of Lineker, who was taken off airs for criticising government asylum plans. TV and radio coverage have been hit throughout Sunday as the standoff between the host and the BBC continues. It follows an unprecedented day of turmoil for the BBC sports operation on Saturday with some of the most recognisable faces and voices associated with the, the broadcast walking out match of the day two followed the main programs much reduced format airing just for 15 minutes and was without the usual commentator and host mark chapman also gone in solidarity no mark chapman either i'll add some of the quotes here speaking ahead of the fulham versus arsenal match just took place today i got a record prem review after this stream 
He said, it's been a very difficult decision to make personally. I can assure you it's not been taken lightly. But I'm a BBC staff me member. I'm a radio commentator for this station. And just like yesterday, we're here to provide our football service to you, our audience. Paul Armstrong, a former Match of the Day editor, said there was a lack of consistency and clear guidelines for how impartiality should um, uh, apply to sports staff. He said he wasn't in the least bit surprised by the collective response from pre presenters, pundits and commentators, adding, I don't know why BBC management didn't really that these guys are a team and that if attack the captain the others are going to withdraw their labor prime minister rishi sunak said the issue between the bbc and lineker should be resolved by the bbc itself speaking to reporters on a plane journey to talks with the u.s president in san diego he did not directly answer a question about whether he had confidence in mr davy and when asked if he would meet lineker to talk about the issue he replied it's not about any one person the BBC has not commented further, so behind, uh, while it has behind-the-scenes efforts to resolve this situation. So, there it is. Mild critique of reduction of asylum coverage for migrants by Gary Lineker creates this unbelievable shitstorm and some of the worst things I've ever seen. Uh, borderline comedic at times, but ultimately, we are going in the right direction, and the direction should be this. Gary Lineker is not a journalist. Gary Lineker uh, is not uh, a politician. Gary Lineker isn't employed by the BBC in that capacity. Gary Lineker is an individual that hosts a fucking game talking about football, soccer, Team American dudes. So... I don't really care about his political opinions, and I also fully support and champion his right to express his political opinions, no matter what they should be, which seems to be the only fair and equitable way that we can go about our lives. So absolutely, the suspension was ridiculous. Absolutely, it is a fever dream concocted by Tory back-channeling. It should never have got this far, and I guarantee that when Gary Lineker is backed next Saturday at the time of recording this, him and all of the crew are going to to, uh, be grinning like Cheshire cats. I even wager he might slip a joke or two in there just to infuriate them even more. Maybe it'll lead to more uh, fallout as a result. But there you go. That's all you really needed to know about the match of the day drama. I know some of you were confused. Richard, Richard, I don't know how to make sense of this. There is a man saying things on Twitter and people are angry. So now you know.